Chapter 5, The Three Bottom Lines <clears throat> and What They Tell You. Have you ever watched people who really know what they're doing pour over a set of financial statements? We're thinking of savvy investors, smart lenders, sophisticated business owners, and financial executives. They spread the papers out in front of them. They go back and forth from income statement to the balance sheet to the cash flow statement. If there isn't a cash flow statement, you can be sure they'll request one. They ask for more information, last year's data, the year before that, even the year before that, and they start making trend charts. Pretty soon they begin asking all kinds of questions. And if you know anything about the company they're examining, you realize the truth. These people learn a phenomenal amount about a business just by studying num the numbers. They can pot spot its strengths. They, can, they understand some of its vulnerabilities and challenges. They often know enough to decide whether it's worth investing or lending money to. Think of how valuable it would be if you can do this for your own business. Think of how valuable it would be if you can really, if you really understood the whole story, the financial big picture, every time you receive a set of financial statements. The value is almost incalculable because if you can understand what they tell you, a complete set of financials is like a set of powerful lenses. Some of the lenses are wide angle, showing you what your company's overall results are. Others give you a close up view. They help you understand nitty gritty details, such as the reason your receivables have been on the rise. With this information, you can manage your business intelligently so as to optimize its performance and achieve your goals. Without the information, you're flying blind. You really don't know how your company is performing and you don't really know why its performance might be improving or declining. The first step in understanding and using the financials in this way is to familiarize yourself with the tools of the trade. That means knowing what a balance sheet, an income statement, and a cash flow statement are and what kinds of information they contain. If you're still not sure what equity or is or how profit differs from cash, please go back and review part one of this book. Learning the financials is like learning any skill. There's no avoiding the basics. Now comes the fun part, understanding what these three statements tell you and why you need all three and how they fit together. Maybe you studied a foreign language in school. Do you remember that wonderful eureka moment when you realized, hey, I understand this stuff. All of a sudden, it wasn't just strange sounding words and boring rules. It was a language with meaning and you can use and you can see and hear things that you couldn't see or hear before. That's what we hope to do for financial statements in this section of the book. Show you the meaning of all, where did I go? Show you the meaning of all those terms and numbers and how they fit together. Then in part three, we'll show you to how to put your knowledge to work in running your company. We'll begin with the fact that a well-run business has three important financial statements and that each financial statement has its own important bottom line. The three bottom lines. The idea that a company has three bottom lines catches a lot of business people by surprise. After all, everyone knows the financial goal of a business is to make a profit, to increase this one bottom line. If it were only so simple. If it were, we wouldn't need anything more than an income statement to see how a company was performing. But the world is rarely as simple as we'd like it to be. If you have been around the business world for a while, you know that profit alone is never a sufficient measure of a company's performance. Companies can be profitable but go belly up. Companies can be increasing in their profits while actually performing worse than before. Companies can be making a profit that looks like a lot of money in dollar terms, but if you stop and analyze the profits, you realize the shareholders would be better off investing in CDs or treasury bills. How can this be? The answer is that profit is only one measure of a business financial performance. It isn't a bad measure, but it can't do the measurement job by itself. As noted in part one, you can't get an accurate picture of a company's financial without three separate statements, and you can't judge a company's performance with fewer than three distinct bottom lines. 
Not surprisingly, each bottom line derives primarily from one of the financial statements. And like the financial statements themselves, each has a distinct each has distinct advantages and disadvantages. Net profit is the first of the three bottom lines. It comes from the income statement, and it shows whether your company sales in any given time span exceeds its costs. It shows whether you're making money. So that is the income statement. As a performance measure, net profit has a lot to recommend it. The business world understands it. It can't be distorted by unpredictable variations in a company's cash flow. It spreads depreciation over an asset's useful life so that, for example, your profit doesn't disappear just because you brought an expensive new machine. But net profit also has many drawbacks, drawbacks as a measure. If you keep an eye on only the net profit, for example, you may be able to keep expenses from exceeding sales, but you won't know how much cash is actually going into your bank account. Maybe your receivables are increasing. Maybe you are spending more than you need to use on inventory. If all your profits are tied up in receivables and inventory, you may run out of cash and have to suspend operations even though you are ostensibly making money. Short of that, you may be doing a poor job at managing your cash and managing your fixed assets. You might be turning a profit, but it is really more than you could earn if you liquidated the business, took the money, and invested in T-bills. But how do, you, how do you know? Another drawback of a profit as a, me as a metric, it is susceptible to accounting distortions. When accountants figure net profit, they often can choose among various legitimate methods of calculating depreciation and valuing inventories. Profit will vary depending on which method they choose. Remember the point made in part one, the income statement is an abstraction. So profit is an abstraction too. Operating cash, cash flow, OCF, is a, second, a great second bottom line. You find it on the cash flow statement. It shows how much net cash is flowing into your company, independent of what you may receive from lenders and investors, and independent of what you use on fixed assets or other investments. It shows the cash you're generating from operations. Why is this helpful? Unlike net profit, operating cash flow, or OCF, is based on real events, cash going in and cash going out and not on accounting theory. Because of this, OCF can't be manipulated internally merely by following different rules for preparing the financial. If your OCF is consistently positive, you know you are generating enough cash from operations to meet your regular obligations. OCF can also be used to test the quality of a company's earnings or profit or profit. Are the, are the profits on the income statement real or have they somehow been manipulated? This was what the investors may, be, may have been worrying about when GE stock price didn't rise as fast as its profits. There are plenty of other examples of this concern. Around 1994, for example, Kodak changed its depreciation method, which made its profits look larger than they otherwise would have. However, investors who check the company's operating cash flow and the footnotes to its financial statements could see that Kodak's financial performance wasn't as good as it first appeared from the income statement. In general, OCF should be consistently larger than net profit. If it is, that's a sign that the business is doing a good job of managing assets such as receivables and inventory. Financial people say it is doing a really good job of turning its profits into cash. If OCF is consistently smaller the net profit, the company is doing a poor job. In some cases, fraud had been discovered when OCF was consistently lower than net profit. So why not use OCF as a single bottom line? Unfortunately, it too can be manipulated, not internally by choosing different account proceed, counting procedures, but externally. For instance, a company can arrange or decide to pay its vendors late, temporarily increasing OCF. It could also increase OCF by sacrificing profitability, which is not necessarily wise. 
In some industries, for example, it is common for an operating company to sell its account receivables to another business known as a factor. The factor pays so much on the dollar for the receivables and then attempts to collect the full amount, which is how it makes money. The operating company trades $1 worth of receivables for, say, 80 cents, 85 cents worth of cash. This move obviously improves the company's immediately operating cash flow, but it can hurt immediate profits because a sale worth $1 has effectively been transformed into a sale worth 85 cents. Return on assets, ROA, is the third bottom line. It is calculated by taking net profits from the income statement and dividing by average assets. Assets are found on the balance sheet. To find average assets for a given time period, you just add the assets at the beginning and the assets at the end and then divide by two. For example, if a company has a million dollars in assets at the beginning of the year and 1.2 million at the end, its average assets for the year are 1.1 million. If it made $100,000 in net profit during that year, the ROA, the return on assets, is $100,000 divided by 1.1 million, or approximately 9%. ROA is a terrific bottom line. It encompasses net profit, so it shows you whether you're doing a good job managing sales and expenses. It also shows you how effectively you're managing assets, such as receivables, inventories, and fixed assets. ROA helps you evaluate what's really happening when your profit moves in one direction or the other. If your profit has risen but your ROA has declined, for instance, it means your assets have grown faster than your profits. That's usually a sign that, if, that you're not managing your assets effectively. ROA has one other big advantage. It allows for a company to compare itself to the competitors in the same industry. Profit levels and cash flow can differ widely from one company to another, but ROA is a kind of universal solvent for companies in the same business. It shows how much profit a company is earning for a given level of total assets. Why not just use the ROA? One reason is that it's little it's a little more complex than any than the other measures, so it could be harder for people without financial training to understand. The real reason is that it too is an abstraction. The numerator, the net profit, has the drawbacks we described above. The denominator, the average assets, depends on how accountants value inventory, how they depreciate fixed assets, and so on. ROA is a good measure. It just isn't perfect, and it still doesn't tell you how much cash you netted last month. The truth is you need all three bottom lines. You need all three measures. Without them, you just can't see the big picture. Your company can look good in terms of dollar profits, but poor when you consider ROA. Your company can be earning a profit, but it, it, but be unable to meet payroll because there's not enough cash. Your company can have a satisfactory ROA, but flat or declining sales, a possible recipe for disaster. With all three, however, you can tell if you're really making money. Just like the ex experts at the beginning of this chapter, chapter, you can read the tea leaves and identify your business's strengths and weaknesses. More important, you can use the knowledge you gain to manage the business more effectively. From my financial perspective, improvement on the three bottom lines is the goal of a business. In few industries, in a few industries, companies find the three bottom lines as we have defined them are not the most useful tools for evaluating performance. One company we are familiar with in the cellular telephone business focuses on E-B-I-T-D-A, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization as a measure for profitability, and on a measure they call free cash flow, which is operating cash flow minus capital expenditures as a measure of cash flow. As a measure of cash flow. In the cable division industry, many firms attack a track, sorry, many firms track EBITDA and also EBITDA minus capital 
expenditures, which is what they call free cash flow. Whatever the variations, however, every company needs to make a profit, generate cash, and produce sufficient return on investment to be competitive. These three bottom lines, which we define here generically, give you a powerful tool for evaluating a business's performance. And the great thing is you don't need a degree in finance to understand and use them. All you need is a little practice. Trend analysis. Here's one more point to keep in mind when you're assessing financial performance. Remember how we noted the financial experts always seem to want more years worth of data and how they're likely to start building trend charts? The reason is simple. A company's financials for one time period, however complete, are a fine starting point, but they don't tell you much by themselves. What you really want to know about a business is how it performs over time and whether its performance on the, those three bottom lines is improving or declining. You'd think this would be obvious, but it happens over and over. Business owners are asked for a set of financial, maybe a prospective lender. They come back with one balance sheet, one income statement, and perhaps one cash flow statement. From the lender's perspective, this is like the Boston Red Sox fan who returned four years on a desert island and asked how the Red Sox had been doing. The answer he got, they whipped the Yankees yesterday, was cheery but it told him nothing about the season as a whole, let alone how they'd done during the, the preceding four years. One year, a complete, a complete set of financials includes two balance sheets, beginning and ending, and an income statement and a, and a cash flow statement. That at least lets you see how the balance sheet changed over the year, but to evaluate a business effectively, you typically need at least three years worth of financials showing all three bottom lines. That lets you chart net profit, operating cash flow, and return on assets over time. It shows you where the real strength and weaknesses lie. Just as a baseball coach would analyze offensive statistics, pitching statistics, and defensive statistics, you can analyze every aspect of your company's financial performance over time. If the statements are set up in columns and allow easy year-to-year -year comparison, so much the better. Ideally, your financial statements should let you see at a glance whether and where you're winning or losing, not just yesterday, but over a meaningful time span. In part three, we'll analyze the performance of SOHO equipment over just such a three-year period. First, however, it's important to see how three, the three statements fit together and how you can capture the big financial picture of a company all on one page. Okay, so that's it for chapter five. Um, I don't know why my camera's acting funny, weird. Um, anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back next video with chapter six. Thank you so much.